Hello, YouTubers. Well, I'm just uh, cleaning up the BX now. I got uh, all the mods pretty well done that I'm going to do for her now. So she was a bit, a bit dusty and had a few little scratches in places and uh, a few other little things that I, I wanted to just to tidy up a little bit. You might call it tractor detailing. Kind of like to keep things in proper order and if you look after it, it should last a long time. But I'm going to go grab the camera there now and I'm just going to take you over. I'm going to show you a few things that I'm doing. And actually, I'm going to show you something that a, that a, uh, a viewer had asked me a question about. So I'd like to show, show you that as well. It's, you'll probably find that a little bit handy. So uh, grab the camera and I'll show you around. Okay, I had a viewer ask me one time uh, last week about the sides of the BX platform. He asked me what I had on it. Well, this is what we call grip tape. Skateboarders use it on their skateboards, and safety guys use it on steps, and it's, uh, it comes in a roll, it comes in various widths and lengths. This one particular one is, I don't know, two inches, and uh, you can buy it by the roll. I think it comes in a 20-foot roll. I think about 10 or $15, no big deal. Now, I like to put it on the side of the BX deck because, uh, well, for two reasons. Number one, this is the first place your foot hits, so you won't slip off it. It's got a good grip to it, and also protects the paint. So it's kind of twofold benefits to it. And uh, I use it in various other places around, around the workshop and outside and whatnot. So it's good stuff. So maybe it might be an idea for you guys to want to do it. I know some guys are spraying. Rhino liners on top of their deck and taking off the mat. I haven't personally had any problems with the mat. I kind of like the mat. So uh, that's what I do. I use the uh, grip tape. Well, like all of us, we get scratches on our rims. So what I usually do is uh, before they rust, I'll uh, clean off the rim and I'll use some Proform PF600, and uh, what it is, it's 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 like a mild thinner, and it'll take any grease or any contaminants off the rim, and then I'll uh, take it and I'll prime it, and uh, basically use a shaker can of primer. What I like to use, I like to use sandable primer, or some people call it high bill primer, and I just give it a quick shot. It's only a matter of a few minutes, and it's set up. If there's any deep scratches, well, you can. Uh, just keep layering it with this stuff and then you can take some fine sandpaper somewhere around I don't know 600 grit and you can just sand it down lightly and then you can uh, shoot with some uh, with some paint and uh, I just use basically for small jobs like that I use the Kubota paint now some people find it expensive and I'm sure there's all other alternatives and there's two types of orange in this, by the way. There's, there's the old orange and the new orange. And this is the new orange, bright orange, too. So uh, that's, that's what I use, you know. And uh, it's quite effective. And it keeps your, your, you know, you know, your machine looking fresh. You know, we, if, if you don't keep up with it, you're going to end up with a machine that's full of dents and rattles and bangs and rust. And so I like to keep it fresh. So. And what I usually do, again, I go in in Kathy's office and I steal her file folders. Well she always said she goes through a lot of file folders but I don't want to tell her why so I hope nobody else does either and I just basically cut it out like you see and I just lay it there and I just spray over my oranges no big deal it's not much to it and uh, away we go it's uh, it's looking fresh again so that's just a, a maintenance tip for you today so there you go, that's the finished product right there. If it, when it dries a little bit, might give it the second coat, but mostly one coat is sufficient. And it makes it look uh, pretty clean. So, and I also take some mild soap and water, and I wash down the machine. If it's really dirty and it's been in the mud, well then I'll pressure wash it. And uh, again, you know, this, you look after it and it looks after you. Well, the tractor is down on all fours now. She's off the jack stands, the grapple is closed up, and we have aluminum. So that's what I'm going to use to make the carriage 
for the grapple and the bucket. So let's start. Okay, I cut the aluminum in sections with the uh, Milwaukee hacksaw because uh, it's too long to uh, get over to the iron worker. It's 20 feet long, those lengths of aluminum. So I just rough cut them. Got to lay it up against the iron worker, and I'm just going to trim them with the uh, angle iron cutter on the iron worker. Okay, I got my four pieces cut. Um, this is the factory edge, but I cut this one with the uh, Milwaukee hacksaw, so I'm just going to put it back in there and I'm going to trim it up. The uh, <laughs> I got the driveway done again, so I'm expecting people to start dropping in. But anyway, we'll continue on as if we were normal. Yeah, I'm going to uh, I'm going to trim this in now in the iron worker. It's got allowances there where you can cut angle iron and round stock. So that's my next step. So I'll try to keep the uh, camera on, let you have some idea of uh, what's going on. Anyway, rather than keep you in the dark all the time. Once we got all these trued up, then we can start piecing it together and uh, see how it works out. And I think it'll work out okay if I can uh, if I can get it just right. So you can see how ragged that edge is now. I hope you can anyway. That's the furnace cutting in, guys. Don't worry about that. Without that, you wouldn't get me out here. So we're going to trim that off. Yeah? So the end wire goes to this slot. That, my friends, is how it's done. Isn't that pretty cool or what? That's a pretty small slice. That's about an eighth of an inch. And I've got it uh, trued up, so now I know that's perfectly square. That being said, aluminum is very, very fussy when it comes into contact with steel. Steel particles get impregnated into the aluminum, and when you're welding it, believe it or not, it can cause you a lot of grief. So, although I really don't like cutting with the iron worker, it hasn't really caused me too much of a problem, so I kind of just put up with it, because there's, there's no other way to, to cut that piece as small as that, or as narrow as that. So I'm pretty happy with it, so we'll continue on. So what I'm going to do is try, try to get my two end pieces, my two end pieces uh, the same size. So we're, we're looking about 19 inches. So if I can get 19 inches out of the two of those, I'll be happy, 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 as they say in Duck Dynasty. So of course, you have to mark them on the inside so you can see them. Maybe what I should do is bring over the camera so you can see exactly how this thing works. That's what I will do. Very short. Okay. Let's see if I can get the camera over here. Okay, I had to chuck it in. I couldn't get the tripod in close enough to the uh, iron worker, guys. So let's see if we can look down, you can see that, that blade, it's uh, almost guillotine-ish. There you go. And that's it. That's how it cuts the aluminum in the angle iron slot. There's also a slot down here for your uh, round stock. And uh, yeah, it's pretty cool. Okay, so here's what we've got to try to do. We've got to join them together like that. 
Normally, if it was a really decorative piece, I would uh, cut the 45s, but with angle iron, I don't do it that way. With angle iron, I'm going to do it just a little bit differently. So, uh, I'm going to mark it, and then we'll, uh, we'll see what we got. I'll try to do this while I'm taping. Let's see, try. Try being the magic word. So, so here's what we got now. We can't use that because that looks pretty bad. It's, it's high on that end. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to notch out this, this area here. And then we'll see what it fits like. So we're going to go notching. shouldn't be using it without the bird. Don't do as I do, do as I say. Let's see what the guard is like. See, the guard won't work in that case. Look, can't get it in there. Uh, it is what it is, guys. Close your eyes if you're nervous. Now. Okay, this is what we got, folks. We got it like that. Matter of fact, what I might do is I might cut a quarter inch off of that. And oh, by the way, this is a two inch by one quarter aluminum. So I'm going to cut a quarter off like this. We're just going to eye it. Because I can hide a lot with the tape. We'll go over our ways of welding it now in a little while. Yes. That's what I'm looking for, like that. That's going to be a nice strong weld. And also it'll give me a good platform to bolt my casters to when I do weld it. So I'm going to continue on and I'm going to do all those pieces and then uh, we'll discuss different methods of welding it. Okay, I got the pieces notched out. Anytime you're, you're trying to do this at home or wherever you're trying to do it, when it comes to the notching piece, always use the shortest piece. And the reason why I say that is because if you spoil it, you're only spoiling a shorter piece. If you notch the longer pieces, and it don't work, and your notching has to be, you know, happens to be off, well, you got a long piece gone. It's like I got a friend of mine, he's a carpenter, he was talking about measuring once, measuring twice and cutting once, but he told me he worked with a fellow one time that said uh, he had a piece of 2 by 4 he cut it twice and it was still too short. So, <laughs> much applies to this, so you, the best thing to do is, anytime you got a notch, angle iron or whatever, Make sure you, you notch the, uh, the shortest piece. Okay, so they're ready to be welded now. So, we got two choices here welding that aluminum. We can use a spool gun, which is the uh, Millermatic 30 amp. Great gun, does nice work. And uh, it, it's MIG. And the wire comes out through the end and the argon and whatnot or we can use the TIG. So what are the advantages? Well, in my opinion, the advantages of the spool gun is fast production work. Not as tidy as the, uh, as the TIG. TIG to me means control, complete control of your wells. You can do what you want with a TIG. With a MIG, when you pull that trigger, it is what it is great on, uh, like I say, on, on a lot of welding. If, you, if I had to have a lot of welding here today, I've had box trucks here, aluminum box trucks, that I had to weld pieces into the floor and I used, I used a spool gun. You would never use a TIG welder for that. So, my choice today and what I'm going to use 
is going to be the uh, the TIG. And this particular system, Dolby, it's a little bit dirty right now, is the uh, Miller Matic, or uh, sorry, the Miller uh, Dynasty 200. And uh, I've had this now since, wow, man, I don't know, since I put the video, and that's probably, boy, 06, maybe even earlier. Yeah, probably earlier. I know there's at least 2,000 arc hours on that machine. And it's a really, really good, reliable machine. I'm telling you, I've, I've had no trouble with it. If it gave out right now, I would get Miller to get me another one. It's, it's just, it's that good a machine. I, I'm a fan of the Miller product, and I'm sure there's equally as good out there. It's just that uh, I can only speak as I find. So, and of course, uh, the cart that it's on is a cart that I built, well, when I got the, the Dynasty. Like I say, it's a bit dirty here now, but you can see that drawer comes way out. It's pretty well full there now. And this is a dual voltage machine. I can hook it up to uh, 220. There's a 220 plug on it. I put this on it, and then that unscrews here, and you can put a 110 plug on it. There's a 110 plug in there somewhere. Honest to God, there is. Oh yeah, there it is. So that can plug in, and there's no changing over with the machine. That's what you do is is uh, just plug it in. The machine automatically knows, and it's also single phase and two phase. I can also convert it over to a uh, arc welder, and there's the uh, the rod holder right there. And I have taken it on jobs, on job sites, and it's worked really well. But uh, if you look at our other my other videos there as well, it's uh, we have a dynasty, not dynasty, sorry, a uh, Trailblazer, 302 Trailblazer that we use for mobile welding. Don't use it a lot, but uh, we pretty well bought it just to look after our regular customers. And we have a few out there with farms and uh, with heavy equipment companies. So we, that's the reason why we bought the uh, the mobile unit because we didn't want to have them have to send them somewhere else when we needed mobile welding done. So I'm going to set up, set the system up now, and I'm going to. Uh, Start up the uh, the Miller the uh, Dynasty, and uh, maybe I can even show you a few wells. Let's check it out. Well, that's pretty well the outline of it. I don't have a dedicated welding table here at the shop because it's uh, the shop is just too small to justify a four by eight table. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to use those two uh, mobile stands that I picked up at uh, Prince's Auto. One is fairly new, the other one's a few years old. And they're great you know, when you rebuild and stuff and that, but they only pass as a welding table marginally. But still, it's better than trying to do it on the workbench. I can use the bike ramp over there to lay them out flat, but then I'd have to put a forklift and a snow one out. So, you know, it's all a compromise. So, uh, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to start tacking that together and then I'll show you what it's like. So I got them clamped. Now there's there's another type of clamp that you can use, which is this. Hang on, I gotta turn this around again so I can see if you're looking at me. Okay. Yeah, you can use this type of clamp, and this is pretty good for heavy stuff, but it, it's really not appropriate for aluminum and and plus it kind of gets in your way to to weld. So I'm just gonna keep it simple and I'm gonna keep this thing out of it for now. And uh I'm just basically using a pier of uh, sheet metal bills, I call them, but they're made by vice grip. And uh, that's what I'm going to do. And once I can keep it together, then I can see if it's square, which it's just about square. So I'll tack it and then I'll recheck it and then I can finish tacking it again. And do one corner at a time. That's my uh, that's my plan, guys. Anyway, one corner one corner at a time. This is not really critical, but if you're going to do it, hey, you know what? Just want to do it well. Keep it square. Keep you out of trouble, then, eh? Okay, what you're hearing running there now is the 
water cooler on the uh, Dynasty. Now most of them don't have it, but when I bought this one I ordered the cooler extra for it. And I, uh, let me see if I can get this up a little bit more. Okay. So uh, when I ordered it, I put a cooler on it as well. Which works out quite well. Now, again, these big old ugly rods, I always cut them short. The fellow said, why do you cut them short? Well, I cut them short so I don't poke anybody's eyes out if I'm watching. Or if they're watching. So, we got to get rid of that now. We'll cut them short. And it's done. Oh yeah, another thing we haven't touched on. We haven't touched on welding hoods. Excuse me for a minute. Uh, we've got to go out of camera range for a minute. Okay. Two hoods. I like Miller. Why two hoods? Well, there's a difference in these hoods. This is called the Miller Digital Elite. Inside, it's all digital. Just a great helmet. Really like it. This here is a Miller Elite. Not digital. Why do I like this? Canadian flag. Canadian loyalty, guys. Sorry, that's the way it's got to be. You guys got your American flag? I love that too. Canadian one, that's what I like to use. So, we're going to put on the Canadian helmet and we're going to see if we can uh, tack this together. I wish Wifey was out so I could uh, get her to hold the camera, but I guess in one sense it's probably better she don't because I'm afraid she'd get a flash watching the helmet. So you guys home there watching this on your computers and your iPads, put on your helmets, okay? Because I don't want you getting the flash. Nah, seriously, you'll be okay. I hope. So let's see if I can get comfortable in a comfortable position here and tack this. Let me see. I got my foot pedal down here. This is how I'm going to adjust my, my amperage. It purge the system a bit. You can hear the argon coming out. Let's see. I can get the camera just a little bit closer for you. I got a gap there and I purposely put it there because sorry about the shaking and that going on guys. Let me see if I can zoom in. I've never tried this before. Now if all you guys go blind watching this, don't blame me. So consider this your warning. If you don't want to watch it, close your eyes. How's that guys? Super cool or what? See if I can hold an electrode or the torch at a different angle so you might be able to see it. But I don't know how good that's going to work because I'm, I'm kind of used to doing it one way. So.
Okay, I apologize if I had my big old hug, ugly head in the way. That's pretty cool. See if I can show you. I gotta turn this around, guys, so I know you're looking at me. See if I can move it back. Okay, guys. That's the last weld I did, and that's the that's the first weld I did. So it's strong, but I got it's not finished yet. I'm gonna continue on doing that piece. You see there, it's not done. Then I'm going to do in here as well, and then I'm going to do the other three corners. And then we'll see what happens. Okay, guys, you just missed the blooper. I burned my, as my young fellow used to say years ago, I burned my singer. Anyway, the glove that I was using had a small hole in it, and I'm telling you, I should have known the difference, but a spark will always find that way to the small hole. So it's time to break out a new pair. Anybody ask me what I use, I like to use Tiggers by Canadian Liquid Air. So, I got a nice little burn and it's pulsating a little bit there, but hey, I'm tough, eh? No good being at this unless you're tough. The hard part now is breaking in a new pair of gloves. Somebody was asking me today about using a milling machine and having my cuffs hanging out. Well, I have never seen anybody in my life tape up their cuffs, but now, that being said, it is a good idea. But to be honest with you, most of the time when I'm using the milling machine, I use these gloves. Now, some people say you shouldn't use gloves when you're machining either, but I do, because I'm after getting a lot of cuts from uh, metal and stuff, so, I don't know, I'd rather use the, I'd rather use the gloves, so, that's why you saw my cuffs hanging out on the milling machine. See, there you won't see it. The problem that I have is when I'm taping, I can't use these gloves because they're too awkward to hold the camera, so I use the rubber gloves. So that's why you saw my cuffs hanging out. But anyway, we got uh, this end done here now, and uh, I'm gonna switch over, I'm gonna mig the other, or uh, TIG the other end now. Okay, I think I got it all welded up. I think I do, I think I do. You hear the cooler cutting in and out of the fan. Yep. 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 And that's done. Okay. I got to uh, take the camera off there and I'll just show you a few things about the way. Okay, hey guys, I'm gonna try to do this with my gloves on. Bear with me. Okay. There you go, you see the welds. Now, where you see the black, that's contamination. That's probably caused by the uh, iron worker, the metal in the iron worker. But it's no big deal. It's a good weld. It's a strong weld. Well, it's not pretty, but you know, it's not bad either. It's, it's as good as it needs to be. If I wanted to do it pretty well, it's not a problem, but uh, it wasn't required here. Now with aluminum, really and truly what you should do before you go to weld aluminum, you should have a stainless steel brush, like this. And what I mean by a stainless steel brush, I mean a dedicated stainless steel brush. If you looked, it says MIG TIG aluminum only. And uh, that's all that brush is used for is just cleaning aluminum. If I take that brush and I use it on a piece of steel, the brush is no longer suitable to be used on aluminum. So I just thought that'd be another little tidbit that you might like to know. Also, in extreme cases, like I have stuff brought into me like manifolds, intake manifolds off hot rods or street cars or whatever and it's essential that it not only be welded strong but aesthetically it has to look good 
And if that's the case, well then you take every precaution in the world. What you'll do then is you'll clean up your metal really well. Clean up your metal really well and you would uh, scrub it down with a stainless steel brush. Then you would wash it in acetone. And that includes your filler rod. You would wash that in acetone as well. And uh, watch your amperage and stuff. Set it all up perfectly. And uh, when you get going, boy, with them roll of diamonds, I'm telling you, it looks pretty impressive. Now, the Dynasty DX200, it's, uh, it's good, they say, up to a quarter inch. I've used heavier metals, but I, I tend to uh, go towards a spool gun if I get up higher than three-eighths of an inch. So that's the reason why I kind of like using the Dynasty on this today. It's, uh, it's kind of a nice system and you know it's it's fairly clean and it's nice when you when you see the finished wells. So what I'm gonna do there now is I'm going to uh, look at my casters. I'm gonna mount my casters on it and see how it fits on the grapple. So hopefully, hopefully it will fit. So now I'm drilling out for the casters. Almost got that done. One more, one more, one more, one more. One thing about the aluminum, there's no weight to it. And that's what I like because when I'm not, when the grapple is on the uh, tractor, I can take this and just hang it up on the wall. It won't be in my way, or, or hopefully it won't be in my way. Okay, got all the casters bolted on. I never went with the lockable ones. I think, uh, I think the freewheel ones will be just fine. Where, uh, where the little Kubota sleeps, it's uh, pretty level out there. So uh, it's only made for the grapple anyway. So uh, I'm going to put it on the floor now and try it shortly. Okay, so I'll pull the pins out now. The leg up to do that. The leg got to be up to pull the pin out. Put the leg back down. Lock it in. That's that's a nice idea what they did there. I like that. Now we shall see. Disconnect the hoses. Hey, look at that. Oh, I think that's pretty good. Well, I had the floor swept up so it wasn't getting any cuttings on it. But yeah, so what I can do now is when I put it in the shed, I can just push it over to the side of the shed because it is 135 pounds and 
Kathy would have a hard time moving that for me. <laughs> but anyway, uh, I don't think I need a handle or anything on it because I can use the uh, grapple itself to move it. But it fits pretty good. At least I think it do. Okay, I got the shop all cleaned up. It's as stormy as heck out there. You can hear the wind. But anyway, we got the uh, the grapple cradle done. And it works well. And uh, Kathy did uh, the decals as well. Land Pride Grapple Cradle. So I was going to give you a demo and show you what it's going to be like down in the the little shed where the back or the tractor sleeps, but it's too stormy. That's not going to happen. Not this night anyway. But anyway, it's a nice light unit and it fits really well under the uh, grapple. It's simple. It's not. Uh, it's not. A, it's not like I invented the wheel here, but it's uh, it's more of a convenience item than an accessory. So uh, it'll come in handy. Like when I want to move it back and forth the shed, it's going to be easy to do. So that's gonna. I'm gonna call this one a completed video. Don't know how long it's going to be yet. I'm going to upload it and uh, try to have it on for you tonight. So thanks again for uh, for looking at the videos and your comments and whatnot. Nice to see the tractor back on its uh, its four feet again. So uh, that's going to be pretty well a wrap for the modifications for now for the BX. I got some more to do, but it's going to be in a month or so. I got to uh, I got too many other things I got to I got to do first. But uh, there will be other videos about other things. So uh, if you get a chance, uh, have a look at our other videos from the past. I'm sure you'll find interesting stuff there. As a hobby, I rebuild or restore old gas pumps and vintage Coca-Cola items and some custom stuff. So if you go on Gasoline Alley, you'll see some stuff there. And you can visit our uh, website at uh, www.specialtyrepairs.ca and you'll see detailed uh, pictures of everything that's uh, restored out in our other place uh, that we call Gasoline Alley. So you'll probably uh, you'll probably enjoy something there too, you know. In the meantime, uh, just wanted to point out too, you know, when I'm when I'm showing you this stuff, I'm showing you the way that I do it. A lot of people might say, "Well, that's not the right way to do it," but it works for me so if it works for me that's good enough I'm not going by textbook uh, in a lot of these things that I do I just do it my way so I hope you can appreciate that in the meantime thanks for watching everybody if you haven't subscribed please do so and uh, please leave your comments I've enjoyed reading every one of them and I've I've tried to reply to every one of them but uh, there's a lot of them so uh, if I miss one please forgive me Thanks for watching guys, have a great weekend.